So I'm going to be talking about the influence of 21st century climate change on uh, southwest precipitation, and in particular, California precipitation, and how internal variability changes um, rain and snow, and uh, with it, the predictability. So California is in a drought, and it's a big deal for us in California. Uh, it's one of the most severe droughts on record, uh, largely attributed to uh, record lows in precipitation and uh, records in high temperature. Uh, it's led to uh, very stringent water restrictions uh, by the governor, and uh, that's affected you know, our everyday lives. Um, it's also affecting the agricultural industry, which, of course, affects uh, the state's uh, economy. Um, so you hear about this every day in the news in California, and you hear about it probably every week in the national news. Um, and you can Google it, California drought, any day, and you'll get um, some new news story. So I did that a couple nights ago, and I got some story in the LA Times. Uh, this one in particular, the mandate on California water cuts slated to continue if drought persists. And so what this particular article says is if the drought continues on through January, uh, the water restrictions are going to uh, be um, extended another six to eight months. And so the reason why they think it might uh, not, or it might, why it might end in January is because of the, the big El Nino that's coming. Um, but, uh, so the point is this big news in California, but California has experienced drought uh, before in the past, and the western U.S. has experienced drought before in the past. Uh, so here's a, a plot, a reconstruction from Ed Cook's paper in 2004, uh, from a, a collection of tree rings throughout the western U.S. Uh, showing the percent of the western U.S. under drought um, where the, the higher values um, higher values indicate uh, drier than normal conditions and the lower values indicating uh, wetter conditions. And this reconstruction goes back to 800 up to the present. Um, and you can see that around 1,000 years you start getting a lot of high values associated with uh, the mega droughts. Um, and then over time, these mega droughts don't seem as prevalent, and you start getting more uh, dips in this time series, um, sort of associated with pluvials. And then, if you actually focus on this, a thousand or this last interval, last hundred years, you can see that maybe there's a slight increase that's occurring too. Um, so, if you have a lot of mega droughts that occurred around the medieval climate anomaly, um, and you have a slight increase that's occurring in the last hundred years, you might want to make an assumption, maybe, that uh, these uh, periods where the northern hemisphere is really warm are associated with uh, large mega droughts or drier conditions in the western U.S. and maybe over California as well. Um, and that seemed to be the case for uh, the CMIP-3 projections in the 21st century, but then CMIP-5 came along said, no, 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 not so fast. Um, and so what's applied here is the wintertime precipitation for uh, the RCP 8.5 scenario. Um, so this is a collection of 78 different uh, models. Uh, so it's uh, you know, the 30-some models that go into the IPCC projections uh, with all their ensemble simulations. Um, and what it shows is, uh, well, so the, the blue, blue colors show wetter conditions, and the reds and oranges show the drier conditions. And you can see that on average, uh, they, they show uh, during the wintertime, it uh, gets wetter in the 21st century, if you believe the models. Um, so you might look at this and say, okay, this is great news for California, great news for, news for California residents, um, and definitely good news for the water resource managers that have to deal with uh, maintaining the water supply. Um, but that might not be exactly the case. So here's a slide that came from uh, a talk from the AGU Chapman Conference last spring on California drought. Um, this is from a uh, talk given by Janine Jones, who's one of the top water resource managers in California. Um, and so she lists the... Uh, uh, certain questions that the water resource managers or the, aren't asking. Uh, and the, you know, she's presenting to a bunch of scientists. Um, so I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and list them. So how much water will it take to end the drought? Can we close the water budget? What caused the drought? How can drought monitoring be improved? And anything containing the word drought index. And so the scientists didn't really like this slide very much. And the reason why is because scientists love asking these types of questions when it's related to drought. Um, so then you might ask, okay, well, what kind of questions are they asking in the, in the water resource managers? So what they're asking for is, you know, the beginning of the season, how much water will we get this season? And in the middle of the season, or how, much more, how much more water will we get? So they're really looking for better predictions. So California precipitation is very seasonal. 
um, in the sense that it doesn't really rain or snow at all in the, uh, or in the summertime. You get a little bit of rain and snow in the fall and the spring, and then we get blasted with rain and snow uh, in the winter. And it's really the wintertime snow up in the Sierra Nevada mountains that we really care about because the, the water infrastructure is built on the wintertime snowpack. Um, so for this talk, I'm mostly going to be talking about uh, December, January, February uh, precipitation over California. So in a very simple sense, you can uh, uh, break down wintertime precipitation in California between a predictable component and a non-predictable component. So the predictive component is something we've all been talking about the uh, last couple of days. Uh, Pacific sea surface temperatures and maybe to a lesser extent Atlantic sea surface temperature influence on California precipitation. Uh, the, very the most common and well-known relationship would be the El Nino or ENSO relationship. Uh, so in general, during El Nino conditions, uh, usually leads to rainier winters over California. And La Nina conditions uh, usually relate to uh, drier than normal uh, conditions in the state. Uh, but then there's also internal variability, which can be quite large for California. So one good example of, is it, of that would be uh, in 2010, the winter of 2010-2011, very strong La Nina uh, in terms of the uh, Pacific, tropical Pacific SSTs. Uh, but over the last few decades, that was actually one of the rainiest winters over California. So this not predictive component can be quite large. So uh, the question is, well, as the 21st century uh, uh, gets warmer and maybe California gets wetter, um, how do these two components change? So you can imagine uh, over the uh, course of time, uh, this internal variability maybe get re reduced and that might uh, help the predictive component. In other words, that would be good for water resource managers. Another possibility is the internal variability might increase and which would make uh, these uh, seasonal predictions even, even worse. And so we'll take that last uh, scenario, uh, increase internal variability and use that as our hypothesis. So our hypothesis would be is changes in the 21st century will cause an increase in atmospheric internal variability in terms of California wintertime precipitation. Okay, so how are we gonna quantify that? And so this will be very much a review for what we've heard mostly. Um, so imagine we have six ensemble simulations. We're, we're gonna use ensemble simulations to quantify the internal variability over time. So imagine we have six en uh, ensemble simulations and this is results for those six different members uh, showing projections in winter precipitation. Uh, reds indicate drier conditions, blues indicate uh, wetter conditions. Uh, and then you, know, you can uh, quantify the, the, the forced response by taking the mean, of the ensemble mean, doing the trend analysis. And if you want to calculate the internal variability in one of these members, say this fifth member right here, you, know, you take that member, subtract out the forced response, and you can quantify the internal variability. So you look for this particular case, internal variability is quite high over Cal Northern California which is the region that we care about for our problem. Um, so it's really just the, the, vari the variability around the uh, forced response. So imagine we have a variable. This can be temperature, precipitation, whatever. And um, over time, it, you have a linear trend in the 21st century. So that would be your forced response. So imagine you have one case where uh, you, you have three different ensemble simulations. And there's a, ensembles disagree a little bit, uh, or they disagree a lot at the beginning portion of the 21st century. But then over time, they start to agree a little more over time. Um, then you have a second case where the opposite occurs, where they agree a little bit more towards the beginning of the, of the time period. But over time, they start to defer quite a bit more. And so that would be more consistent with what our hypothesis would be, an increase in internal variability. Um, so the method we're going to do is we're going to take uh, two different chunks of the time series, two, two different chunks of the 21st century. Take the, uh, the early, 20, early 20 years, so the first 20 years of the simulation, it's actually 2006 to 2025. Um, and then we're going to uh, take the surface forcing, the SSTs and the sea ice conditions from RCP 8.5 uh, simulations and run a series of AMIP simulations. So we're going to use an atmospheric general circulation model and force it at the surface with sea ice and sea surface temperatures. Uh, and then we're gonna do the same thing for the last 20 years and then look to see how uh, the variance changes for precipitation over California. Okay, so the model that we're gonna use for this is uh, called the Global Spectral Model. It's actually called uh, ISO-GSM. Uh, it's actually got water isotope traces in, in it. 
Uh, but I'm not going to be showing any isotope results. Um, uh, so it's a T62 resolution run it at about two and a half minute time steps. And there's about 28 vertical layers in the atmosphere. Um, so it also has a, a land model. It has the NOAA land model. And it's been one of the good things about GSM is there's been a few studies that have validated the precipitation over California pretty extensively, um, mostly with precipitation and using the, the isotopes that are built into the models. So we have a pretty good confidence that the model does pretty well over our, our study region. Okay, so like I said, we're going to take the first 20 years and we're going to choose two different models. We're actually going to, uh, in the future, what we're currently doing is using uh, more CMIP-5 models uh, to do these experiments with. Uh, but the results I'm going to show today are just for the GFDL CM3 and the IPSL um, CM5 LR uh, simulations. Uh, so again, these are RCP 8.5 scenarios. Um, we're going to run it. Um, so the, we calculate the, the seasonal cycle SSTs and, C, uh, and sea ice distributions. And so it's just a repeating seasonal cycle over and over in these simulations, these AMIP simulations. Um, so we're going to do three different runs of each one of these cases, so each one of these models for the early 20th century, um, and do it run for 50 years, I'm going to do it three times. So it's really 150 years of modeled simulations. Um, let's see. And then uh, we're going to do the exact same thing, but for the last 20 years, for these same models. Um, we're going to do it both with and without the CO2 and, and methane and greenhouse gas emission, or greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to quantify how much of, it's, how much of the variance is due to the actual surface forcing and how much of it is actually related to actually putting the greenhouse gases directly into the atmosphere. And then we're going to, what we're, eventually what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the variance, uh, simulated, uh, simulated precipitation variance. And we're going to use an F test of variance uh, to test the, uh, whether or not the variance actually changes. Okay, so just to give you some sort of sense of what the model does. So here's the results of the E21 GFDL simulations. So like I said, there's three different runs, and they run for 50 years. And this is uh, just calculating uh, DJF precipitation for this box region right here over California. Um, and you can see that uh, the model for these three different cases, the mean precipitation is roughly about the same. It's about 3.9 uh, millimeters per day. Uh, but uh, there's quite a bit of variability. In fact, you see all these large variations. There's no changes to the, to the surface forcing. The only changes is really, in the essence, uh, the initial conditions are different. Um, so you get a lot, a lot of variability about this mean. Uh, but you actually can actually treat what, each one of these simulation years as a different model realization and put these onto a histogram. And so that's what's done here. So here's the histogram. The, the thin line here is actually the histogram. And then the thick curve is the Gaussian fit to the, the histogram. Um, so it's really the, but it's really the shaded region that we're going to focus on. So the shaded region is the variance about the, the, multi, the, the model mean, I guess. Um, and so the variance here is 1.7 millimeters per day. Okay, so that's good. Um, but when you compare that with the late 20th century, you can see that the distribution shifts a little bit. So in addition to a slight increase in the mean, there's also an increase in the variance. It goes from 1.7 millimeters per day to about 2.3 millimeters per day. It's about a 35% increase in variance. Uh, but when we performed an F test on uh, each one of these, uh, on the, the, these two sets of uh, data, we found that the probability is only about 0 0.07, so it's not quite at the 95% confidence level. But if you put CO2 and methane and the other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we, we find the variance actually increases quite a bit more. Um, in fact, it goes from 1.6 now to 3.1 millimeters per day, so almost a doubling of the variance. And uh, when, we, when, we, uh, when we performed the F test, uh, it, was it was significantly different at the 99% confidence level. Um, so that's a GFDL case. So what we found for the GFDL case is there was an increase in the internal variability. Uh, for the IPSL case, uh, we uh, here's the, the early 21st century. Um, what we found relative to GFDL is the precipitation is higher and the variability itself is actually higher. Um, but when we actually force it with the, uh, the last 20 years of the, of the 
21st century, we find that the variance increases for both with and without the CO2 and, and methane gases. Um, so what that's saying for both of these cases is that something going on in the surface forcing that's causing the internal variability to increase. Um, and then sometimes, or at least for the GFDL case, this adding the, uh, the greenhouse gases actually increases the internal variability even more. Um, so I, I'll admit, I haven't totally diagnosed why this would be the case. Um, obviously, it has something to do with the surface forcing differences. So what's plotted here is the, the SST differences for the winter time for the two cases. Left shows the GFDL, um, the right shows IPSL. Uh, oranges and yellows show like uh, the regions where there's warmer SSDs. There's warmer SSDs everywhere because it's the RCP 8.5 scenario. Um, but if you compare these two, you don't see, uh, in terms of the Pacific Ocean temperatures, you don't see a, a pattern that's really that consistent. Um, maybe you have something come, coming off, uh, you know, the eastern uh, North Pacific, but there's really not a consistent pattern. And one thing that really stuck out to me maybe was that you know, they all have these sea ice laws, so maybe this has something to do with Arctic amplification. Um, and there have been studies that have looked at Ar Arctic amplifications and how that changes uh, the jet stream and how the changes in the jet stream uh, might affect things like weather and climate extremes. Um, so when you look at the, the jet stream, so here's just the general uh, a geopotential height at 200 millibars for the GFDL case, uh, early 20th century or early 21st century. Uh, and you can see that uh, there's a permanent ridge right along the, the right along the coastline, and then there's tro permanent troughs uh, on either side of it. And if you uh, subtract this out from the late 21st century case, you can see how this changes over time. Um, and you see that this ridge that occurs right here actually gets even stronger, and uh, there's a dip to the left and a dip to the right. Or to the east, and, or to the west and the east. Uh, so what this shows is that the, the what jet stream is actually getting wavier, and maybe this is has something to do with uh, increases in uh, internal variability. But it's, this is all sort of I'm not totally sold on this quite yet. Um, but anyway, back to our hypothesis. We hypothesize that changes in the 21st century uh, will cause an increase in atmospheric internal variability in terms of California wintertime precipitation. And we haven't done a complete set of, set of simulations, but our results thus far would indicate that this is true. Uh, but going back to what we, why we even care about this to begin with, you know, do, uh, uh, will this af affect California water resource managers? And our results say that seasonal precipitation in California might become more difficult to predict in the 21st century, just based on our, our results. So there are some limitations in our approach here. Uh, very simplified AMIF simulations, but uh, our results would suggest that uh, the seasonal predictions will become more difficult. So I'll leave it there. <laughs>